Welcome to 502 Conversations. I'm Brian Kirby. My guest for this episode is Dr. Rodney Schmaltz, Associate Professor at McEwen University, and I have, as always, an extensive bio on him. I'd like to read it just so everyone knows what he does, what your qualifications are. Thank you for coming today. Happy to be here. You say that now. <laughs> That's right. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> we'll see, but based on his expertise, we'll see how he evaluates this program. <laughs> okay. So speaking of that, uh, your research focuses on pseudoscientific thinking with an emphasis on strategies to promote and teach scientific skepticism. And regardless of academic success, I'm sorry, regardless of academic success or scientific training, many people hold ideas that are not supported by empirical evidence, such as ghosts, aliens, and psychic powers. And you want to understand why and find strategies to help combat those beliefs. You are a former chair of the Research Ethics Board at McEwen University, and you continue to work with government agencies on topics such as ethics, review, I'm sorry, such as ethics review in emergency situations and the role of lay representatives in government organizations. Your expertise is on critical thinking, social psychology, consumer behavior, decision science, decision processes, risk perception, and research ethics. Dr. Schmaltz has several publications and conference papers and is a member of the American Psychological Association and the Association for Psych Psychological Science. One of your most recent publications is Redefining Critical Thinking, Teaching Students to Think Like Scientists, and that was published in Frontiers in Psychology, and I have a quote here. Believing in something which can't be explained isn't a reflection of intelligence, but rather a lack of training in the ability to think critically. Yes. And I apologize if anybody's going to pick up that I've switched from uh, using your name to pronoun and back and forth. So <laughs> if anybody cares, <laughs> don't send me an email. All right, so now you know why I said critical thinking, because once this is over, you may want to reevaluate your decision. <laughs> First of all, let's, uh, what is critical thinking, and why not just thinking? And what I mean by that is we always think we're thinking and using evidence to evaluate our decision-making from buying car, from, from, from not necessarily a scientific perspective, but from everything we do, such as buying a car or... Um, a house or uh, uh, a cereal or finding a maid or what school. We always think we're thinking. So why do you need to define something as critical thinking? That's a good point. I actually don't like the term critical thinking that oh. much. I find it too broad. Uh, oh, it's too broad. It's too broad. Because with critical thinking in terms of skepticism, we have a fairly good sense of what we mean by that and that we're talking about being critical about extraordinary claims generally. So the idea that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence and so on. But if you look at what critical thinking means kind of across the board, it can mean almost anything. So it's a great question in the sense that what does that term mean? When I was doing some research looking at enhancing, we we'll call it scientific thinking skills. Okay. I was looking at critical thinking as like, okay, what is critical thinking? And the definitions range widely. And I was looking at different activities, uh, especially for kids, to train critical thinking, and some of them were like math questions. And they were good questions, they were fine, but they weren't how I would conceptualize critical thinking. It was just, as you say, it was basic learning. And uh, so I, I wrote a paper addressing that and said that one thing we should focus on is looking at scientific skepticism. And that's really what I promote, is this idea that we need to train people to think like scientists. So let me, and I, I'm sorry, you probably don't know this. This is a conversation, so if you say something I don't understand, I may, I don't oh, want to yeah. get you off track, but I have to back up. No problem. Bit. So you're attempting to narrowly define critical thinking so it makes more sense, or you're just trying to say, let's switch over to scientific thinking when we're talking about critical thinking? Um, I think we should make the distinction. So okay. it's not that critical thinking is bad, and most of the activities that fall under that banner are fine, but it's so broad that, like I said, it kind of encapsulates everything. But if we can get a little bit more narrow and talk about scientific skepticism, then we're specific. We're training people to think like scientists. Okay. So when we see a claim, here are some skills we should have to be able to evaluate that claim. So really what I'm training people in is essentially how to differentiate good information from bad. At its simplest form, that's really what it is. Whereas critical thinking can be a lot broader than that. And that's not bad, but what I'm interested in is if somebody gets a claim that homeopathy works. Okay, so what do you do with that claim? What skills do you need to be able to really determine if that is true? And uh, that, that's what I've been researching, and uh, that's what I've been doing in my classes. So I teach a class on scientific skepticism, and I weave that throughout uh, the majority of the courses that I teach. You're teaching university students. Yes. Uh, what year, by the way, or is it all? Um, the course on scientific thinking 
and pseudoscience is a fourth year course. Oh, okay. So they're even older. That's right. So what do you find? So you're not seeing high school graduates at 19 come in and take your course. You're seeing them after they've had three years of college already. Well, I'm getting both. I teach some introductory courses as oh, well. You do? Okay. Yeah, so I teach some intro courses. Um, once in a while, I'll teach some 200 level course. It kind of depends on the year, but I always do the pseudoscience course, and that's the 400 level students. And I also teach an advanced methodology course, and that is a lot of the students that are in the honors program. So they're the students at the top. But a lot of these beliefs are still there, which is so. That was my question. So you can see people one, two, three, four years. That's right. From any year. So have you bothered to do any try and collect any data on someone that comes in as a freshman, what they're thinking in your course, as opposed to someone that's been there for three years? Now you get to see them in the fourth year. Are they different? Are they still pseudo scientific? Uh, we're collecting that data now. Okay. We've revamped our introductory course, and we're collecting data, and we've got some critical thinking measures as well as some, some belief measures. We're going to see if it actually changes. Uh, there has been some research done on it. Uh, it doesn't And uh, Let me get to my... Okay, the, yeah, the, sure. The heart yeah. of my question is, within that data, will you find out if three years of college makes a difference? Exactly. That's my question. Well, this a general specific college education. project... Okay will look directly at the impact of this course. All right. So not the course I'm teaching, but our introductory course. Are the students getting better in terms of critical thinking? I haven't collected data yet looking at the difference between um, first year and fourth year just overall, but some people have done that. And what the best predictor of a reduction in belief in pseudoscience is training in science courses, but the belief actually doesn't go down that much. It's still quite prominent. And even the students that I'm working with, and they, they've been getting exposure to a lot of these ideas, there's usually one area of pseudoscience that they'll still buy into. So it, it's really interesting when we look at our biases, we, we understand how other people could believe these things, but we can all fall prey to a lot of different claims. So the big one um, for us, it's usually things like chiropractic medicine. So people say, okay, ghosts are a bit silly, and you know, I know there's no such thing as Bigfoot, but my chiropractor has really helped me out. And in fact, I just had a student say that to me. So um, one of the assignments that I give to the students is they, I give them a topic and they have to do a lot of background research and present it to the class. And she happened to get chiropractic medicine. And she said, well, I go to a chiropractor. I know it works. I said, great. So just show me the best evidence. And two weeks passed and she came up to me and said, so I quit going to my chiropractor. <laughs> and she's kind of laughed. I'm going to a massage therapist. Is that okay? <laughs> yeah, I, th I think that's fine. But you allow people to explore. As long as they don't tell you that they're curing your allergies. And... Which is what I told her. That's right. It depends what the claim is. If it's to help you relax and just reduce some stress and yeah, you're getting a massage, absolutely fine. If it's for almost anything else, probably not. It's interesting you mentioned that you have to, just the general science isn't enough. I interviewed a physics teacher who did honors at a high school. And, you know, critical thinking is a uh, do you mind if I just use that? Oh, term? no, that's okay. fine. So yeah. critical thinking is kind of an interest to me. So I asked her, and I thought, that, you know, in the, even in the general science physics honors, I said, well, how do you find your students are with critical thinking about how does this translate? And she goes, oh, we're always critically thinking just by the nature of the work that we're doing. And, and I thought, I, I don't think so. But you're yeah. not allowed to just go into a school and give a test to find out, you know, can I give this survey to your students? You have, there's a whole bunch of permission processes that you have to go through. Right. As I'm sure you probably know, <laughs> but you need that information. That's what we're working on now. We ran a project last year where we went into a high school. Uh, we focused primarily on grade 9 students, but there was a, a range. And what we did is we created a single lecture. And we had some pretty interesting activities. One was a magic trick. Another used foyer, the foyer sketch. So people got feedback on a personality test, but everybody got yeah, the yeah. same feedback, the, the basic there. And uh, we then measured if it reduced belief in pseudoscience. The problem was we weren't getting enough consent forms back from the kids. And it was a really complex study because we had different classes exposed to the manipulation being the, uh, the lecture at different times. And we're looking to see if there's you know, a difference pre, post lecture, and then to see if those differences extended on. And we just didn't have enough students sign the consent and have their parents sign the consent to do any meaningful analysis on it. Do you think that they, they, did they take the survey first and you weren't allowed to publish or they didn't take the survey? They, they don't take the survey if we didn't get the consent form. And do you, was there information in the consent form that you think may have deterred people? Like we're, this is about critical thinking, we're going to ask about religious beliefs, we're going to ask about this and that. We were worried about that, but I don't think that was that it. That was not it. Anecdotally from the teachers, 
they, kids just, They're just lazy to bring them yeah, home. Right. Yeah, it, it's not interesting to them. It's not really important in the sense that their grade isn't relying on it. So that was one that's pretty easy to stick in the bottom of the backpack. And yeah, yeah. So we're gonna try it again. Uh, we're actually going to look at younger populations. Uh, this year we're gonna try it with kids that are in grades four, five, and six. The idea was that when you're introduced to science, you should be introduced to scientific thinking. Science is often just seen as a collection of facts, especially at that young age, or at least that's the way kids perceive it. And then it's really hard to change people's opinions once it's established, so once they hit university. But if we could start training kids how to analyze information at a young age, even if it's at a, a very simplistic level, and start building those skills, it's, uh, they have a much better chance of being good consumers of information when they grow up. I'm going to pause you right here because I want you two things I need to do. One is I'll ask you to define scientific thinking. Okay. Um, but before I do that, um, I'll switch over from critical thinking to scientific thinking. Critical thinking is fine too. But my, what I want to say is that I don't want people to go critical thinking, oh, poo poo, um, that's a philosophy thing. We don't need to think about that because I've met very intelligent people, um, politicians um, that profess belief in Reiki, which has to yep. be one of the most implausible things. How could anyone Reiki channeling the energy of the universe through your hands and I can heal you without touching? It's laughable, it right? Is. Star Wars laughable. Um, and these promoters ends up getting into the government where they want to get reimbursed for health insurance and such uh, things like that. So it's important to be able to evaluate these and say this is scientifically implausible, really no reason to test it, or here's how we test it to find out. Um, and on the consumer level, there's already billions of dollars spent a year on these kinds of things. I don't want to see my insurance company paying for it. I think chiropractic is covered in my state. Right. Um, they haven't covered homeopathy, I don't think, but you know, they're always, there's always a lobby to get these things done. So it's very important to try and save ourselves money and gain wisdom. Absolutely. I hope you don't mind that disclaimer. Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's why it's important. So if you don't think scientific thinking or critical thinking is important, just watch an ad for beer that has a bunch of ladies in bikinis and ask yourself, well, how does that make the beer taste better? <laughs> exactly. exactly. So now, what is scientific thinking? The way I look at it, it's basically taking a claim and seeing if it undergoes the scrutiny of scientific rigor. So that's a bit rigid, but you have to have an understanding of how science works at its core. So you need to understand how an experiment works. And I think we can train kids at a young age how to do that. Really simple stuff. So you have a control group, you have an experimental group. You might not use the terminology even that advanced yet, but one group of people is getting a drug, another's not getting the drug. How do they feel after? Then explain what the types of things are that you need to look at to make sure that, say, one drug is working and but one isn't. And the way we thought about it was, what if we showed kids magic tricks? That was one of the things we did and then said, okay, so you've seen this trick. Now, as you know, I'm a psychic, or is there another explanation? And the kids all start laughing. Like, no, you're not. <laughs> and they start thinking about it. So, well, okay, how would you test it? And it's those types of things where you're training them to be thinking like scientists, where they don't even really realize that that's what's going on. They're, they're like, I'm gonna figure out how that's done. And I think when you use things like that that are very engaging, then you've got a shot at changing kids' minds. So the idea is not for them to just be thinking, oh, that was a cool magic trick. It's when somebody makes an outrageous claim, you're like, wait a second, that's just like that magic trick they showed me. Or that's just like that foyer sketch, which of course we don't call it that, but just like that personality test they gave me. Uh, with my advanced level courses, it's, it's hard to change beliefs, so I do a lot of unusual stuff. So I, um, I take the students on ghost hunts. We do that every year, so I show them some of the television shows on ghost hunting. Say, okay, maybe there's ghosts, but let's look at what they're doing. Let's go do it. And we'll go to a supposedly haunted location and then show what's really going on there and show it's usually shadows or something along those lines. Uh, I have them do a pseudoscience super challenge. So I have them break into teams and they actually get to win coffee. I buy them coffee. They have 45 minutes anywhere they want to go in 45 minutes and find the best example of pseudoscience. And they're blown away because they're on a university campus and they all come back with something great. Well, terrible, but great in the sense that it's, it's a classic example of pseudoscience. So it's those types of activities I think you need to do to really engage people. Because if you just tell someone homeopathy doesn't work and you'd have to be crazy to believe that, well then all those biases and you know everything we do, our defense system kicks in, right? So you, d dissonance kicks in, you know, our self-esteem is threatened. And uh, tying back to your earlier point, there's research showing that as people are more intelligent, 
they're better at defending their own argument, but worse at accepting the argument of others. I have read that, yeah. Yeah, so it has nothing to do with intelligence. So you have these extremely intelligent people who know a lot in some areas, and they're very good at defending their position, and they're very good at justifying things like Reiki. Because how could they be wrong? Exactly. I'm smart. Exactly. They're better at rationalizing. Exactly. When you, speaking of the ghost hunting thing, have you ever been able, I know this would be a real long shot, but just like with the psychics and the, um, the mediums, if you take an unedited show, it's a three-hour show boiled down to a half hour of correct answers. I can't imagine if you actually got your hands on some footage from one of these ghost hunting shows, how many hours of footage they have to make that one show. Oh, yeah. Well, Do you have any, have you ever had a producer or somebody behind the scenes? I haven't yet. It would be fascinating that, yeah, to right. talk to them, though. You probably need to get a rogue one, though. Somebody that's yeah, yeah, I don't think they'd be too happy <laughs> with what's going on. But I do know uh, Kieran O'Keefe. He's a researcher in the UK, and uh, he's a paranormal psychologist, but he's a skeptic. And he was on a show called Most Haunted, so I got a little bit of the background information there. Okay. And uh, so there was a psychic that was on the show as well. So they'd have the group go in, and as with all haunted shows, not a lot tends to happen because they're walking around an old building, but right. there's, there's nothing going on. So then the psychic would do some channeling. And Kieran thought that the psychic, his name was Derek Akura, was being fed information. And the reason he thought that is they were at, a, I believe it was a castle, and Derek put his hand on this bed and started talking about all the things that happened there. And he was right on all of it. But the problem was, it was the wrong bed. Oh. <laughs> it was the bed's on a different floor. <laughs> so Kieran Oops. set him up. Yeah. So what Kieran did is he told one of uh, the people on staff that when we go to this next location, that there's this jailer that's supposedly haunting the place. And his name is Creed Kafer. Don't tell Derek. So... Derek goes to the location, gets possessed by Creed Kafer, which oh. is an anagram of Derek Faker. <laughs> so he set him up. So and the producer tipped him off. Or? That's right. So the producers had to tell him Creed Kafer was made up. It's an anagram of Derek Faker. So then Kieran knew exactly how Derek was doing this. And did that make it into the show, or is that just something you learned? Uh, it made it into the show, but they didn't do the debunking in the show. But the possession is in the show. You can actually see it on YouTube. But that's what I mean. So they did... So they they produced the show and broadcast it as if it happened. That's right. But there was a newspaper article after saying that Kieran had basically set him up. Oh, it's disappointing because, first of all, I find reality fascinating. Right. And that can get good ratings, too. Absolutely. Um, I mean, does the whole... They, these shows need to come with more of a disclaimer, I think, that, you know, this show is based on true events because some of the things happened, but we faked everything here just to, for... Um, uh, in order to keep it brief. <laughs> right, exactly, yeah. <laughs> right? And uh, I mean, even with the ghost hunts we do, we'll film them and I'll edit it and show it to the class and make it look like something happened. Oh, good. Yeah, and it, it takes no time at all. I mean, one, uh, one of the students tripped on something, so it was perfect. Oh, yeah, good. <laughs> Some of the students started doing a, a seance and then I just put in the sound of the person tripping and it seemed very convincing. <laughs> but, <laughs> totally uh, fake. Exactly, exactly. But again, let me just, I'll play devil's advocate because I'll go back and forth from trying to look smart and then trying to just take the <laughs> consumer point of view. So consumer point of view, what do I need scientific thinking for? You know, it's 2018, I get on the Google and right. I go, blah, 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 what's best? And pops up. Why do I need to think about it? I can find the answer right away. That's why we need it more than ever because you don't know what the answer is. You can find anything. I just found it. Internet. Exactly, found it. But you don't know if that information I found is good it, or bad. I, I found five answers. Four of them I didn't really want to hear. The f fifth one I liked, so that's the <laughs> exactly. one I took. Exactly. Yeah. If you don't have the ability to determine what is valid information, then it's very easy to make mistakes. And the people that purvey this, especially in a, uh, more of a consumer behavior type idea, they're good. They, they are good at selling it. Uh, they're convincing. And people have a natural predisposition to believe. So we don't think we're being lied to. Why would you lie about somebody's health? And especially the ones that are particularly foul where they talk about you know, cancer treatments and things like that. Uh, I just read one today. There's a chiropractor that claims they can cure diabetes. So we're getting into that type of area. Now, when you hear claims like that, you can imagine that somebody who's suffering from, say, cancer, they hear a claim that this will cure you. Of course you want to believe. And why would anyone lie to you? So if you don't have those skills, you could easily be duped. And, I mean, there's the obvious cost and you're giving money to a treatment that simply won't work. But then there's the opportunity cost. And that, that's time where you could be getting real treatment. And with something like cancer, I mean, that's critical time. I mean, if we look at Steve Jobs, 
if he had gotten treatment right away instead of going on a, a juice cleanse and getting acupuncture, there's a very good chance he would have survived. Brilliant person, but just didn't have those critical thinking skills or chose not to employ them in this environment. I have two questions about that. Um, I want to, I'll back up just slightly. One is when you're doing the fourth, fifth, and sixth graders. Right. And let's say I go on, to, I need a new pair of basketball sneakers. That's a sixth grader. Mm. I go onto the internet, I research, oh, Nike, these Nike sneakers cost $150, and they say, oh, make you jump higher. Oh, these Reeboks cost 99 and they also say they'll make me jump higher. Well, they make claims like that sometimes right, that right. based on the, the air technology. Well, I'm not even going to get into it. But you, or you can pick an off-brand name for 40 bucks or something. So do you talk about how to evaluate those claims? I mean, you're relying basically on the authority of the advertiser at that point. That's right. We, we will be talking about that, so we're still building Because that's a real a kid thing, right? Exactly. Okay. Go ahead, sorry. So we, what we hope is that kids will see that and say, okay, maybe it makes me jump higher, but where's the evidence? What do I need to know? And even just that little bit of thinking rather than going, oh, that's probably true. Because you see something on TV, especially when you're young, I mean, we, we all fall prey to that, right? So why, why, would, would, they why lie? would they lie to me? Right. And, uh, but just that little bit of critical thinking. Because, I mean, at least with, say, the shoes, if you like the shoes and they feel good, great. But if somebody doesn't have money for them and they, you know, they desperately want them because they truly believe it's going to help them, that, that's when we start getting into problems. So hopefully you give kids those tools to say, well, maybe not. Maybe I need to look a little bit farther and then provide them with some resources. Well, where do you go to find out? What should you be looking for? And that, that's the goal of what we're doing. That's what we're building right now. Um, and let me ask the second part of that question. I want to actually read a little thing I have here because besides advertising and my four out of five questions on the internet, Maybe I don't have time to look into detail on all, everybody's, those five people are making similar claims and I have to decide which one is the authority. Right. So I don't have time to do all, I can't follow the links to say this is research, this is research, this is, here's the publication. So at some time, at some point I have to depend on authority. So how do you choose a good authority? It's not easy, but. Because a lot of people can put PhD next to their name. Oh yeah. Well, it Or at, naturopath or whatever. Yeah. There's, there's a lot of uh, online universities. Oh, well, before, I'm so sorry. Uh, not anybody can put uh, no. me in. No. Actually, anybody probably could, but not everybody deserves it. So how do, that's my question. Right. That's the critical thinking part. Who deserves it? <laughs> so go on. I'm sorry. Oh, I, no, I didn't no, want to insult no, anybody. No, by no. Well, I, I think what you're referring to is the fake PhDs. Maybe, but even some, some PhDs can be a little... Well, there's basically two problems. So we've got the fake PhDs. You can get a PhD in a week for however many thousand dollars from a non-accredited oh, institution. Oh yeah, there's, there's a bunch of those out Ooh, there like and they're just that. absolutely fraudulent. So in the academic community, everyone knows that it's not a real PhD, obviously, but the average person doesn't know that there could be a distinction there. So if somebody claims to be a doctor, you believe that they're a doctor. I think what's probably even more troublesome is when people go outside their realm. So if you have a PhD, you have expertise in a fairly narrow area. And what you'll see is somebody have a PhD in, say, economics, but now they're talking about health. Well, you're not qualified. You haven't done any training in health. So while you may have a lot of expertise in this area and be very good, what you're talking about here isn't what you have that knowledge in. But I can't be a biologist, a chemist, and a physicist. Right. So what do I do? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I have well, to choose my authority. I think what you have to do is if you understand what the warning signs are of pseudoscience, then you've got a shot at it because you can't look at everything. You're right. We're busy. But if you understand what some of the warning signs are, then when something just feels off, then it might be time to investigate a bit farther. So when you start getting those extraordinary claims, that extraordinary evidence, um, you start understanding what psychobabble looks like. So things that sound sciencey but aren't. Uh, you've got a lot of claims with anecdotal evidence. Those should be cues that it's time to maybe step back and say, there might be something wrong here. Not necessarily, but this is one that I need to look a little bit farther into. If you've got a claim that doesn't have any of those cues of pseudoscience, it's not a guarantee that it's not, but it's much less likely that it is. And maybe that's where that scrutiny is not going to kick in as much. Because, I mean, we get bombarded with information. You're absolutely right. You can't look at everything. And if you read medical articles, they're, they're dense and they're technical and they can be hard to understand and they might be behind a paywall. So it's hard, but it's, it's the ability to just have that sense of this doesn't seem right. I'm going to go deeper here. You just mentioned um, 
a medical journal or medical paper and all that. Um, but anecdotes and testimonials and a quote by my dog had whatever, you know, even, even just a personal testimony is so powerful for everybody else as opposed to a statistic or some data uh, or data. Absolutely. So, you know, or a mother's group that, w tell me about that because we're, I, I, I like to think that I'm rational, but I know that I make emotional decisions. So I'm not going, I'm fooling myself, but at least I know I'm fooling myself. Yeah, yeah, well, we all do. I mean, we, a good story is incredibly powerful. And that's something we will all fall prey to. Anecdotal evidence is extremely powerful, but it's that ability to recognize that perhaps that is not good evidence. And it doesn't mean it, it's always bad, but if there's anecdotal evidence, that should be step one, then you want to look farther into the claims. Um, with anecdotal evidence too, if there's a claim and it's all of the evidence supporting is anecdotal, that's a real warning sign. But I think the more day-to-day -day anecdotal evidence is somebody saying, I tried XYZ, it worked for me, I feel great. They're your friend, you trust them, you yeah. try that thing, right? And if you look at even something, again, like homeopathy, it's sold in drugstores besides real medicine. So your friend says that it worked, it's sold with medicine, why wouldn't it work? And that's where we need to train people to try to get over, uh, not the bias, I suppose, but just try to take that extra step and realize that anecdotal evidence, it's, it's not that it's wrong inherently, but there's not much value in it in the sense that we need to be thinking like scientists and really see what kind of tests have been done here, if any, to validate the claims that are being made. Well, homeopathy or homeopathy, however you pronounce yeah. it, I go homeopathy. Um, but actually, that's probably bad because it sounds more medical than homeopathy. <laughs> but homeopathy, it looks like a medical word. Yeah. It's got pathy in it. I know that's in a lot of medicine. There's a lot of pathologies and pathological and naturopathy and chiropractic, whatever. The, the P-A-T-H comes in a lot oh, yeah. of medicine. Um, so it sounds like medicine. But as far as critical thinking goes, all you have to do is define it in exactly. a sentence and it seems to uh, water has memory and not only that but it's diluted beyond the scope of the universe so it must work it doesn't make sense when you define it but it sounds like something so i don't know how much you've talked to people that actually believe it but do they know what it is have you had a, I, have you had experience with people that yeah. use it and did they know what it is and they no. so once you say this is actually what you're doing yeah then, then they go oh i didn't know that or i did know that they all the what people that i've talked to that have used it just didn't know uh, because I mean, it's next to medicine. Exactly, and we don't look up medicine. Who right. has the time to do that? You assume it works. That that should have been covered. If I can buy it theoretically at a drugstore, the the research should be there. That shouldn't be theoretically my job. because medicine has been proven safe and effective. Exactly, homeopathy has not. But we will go on. That's from right. There. They're side but by it side. Doesn't say so that. No, exactly. There's not a. This has been proven safe and effective vial. Here's the bull vial. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I mean, uh, in Canada. It's endorsed, I believe it, I'm not sure if it's still true, but it was endorsed by Health Canada Homeopathy in terms of safety, because it's safe. Oh well, yeah, there's nothing. There's nothing in it. Not always. Well, so, that's true, yeah. It's just recently, some, but yeah. it should be safe because it, there shouldn't be anything in it. Exactly. Go on. <laughs> but if you read that it's endorsed by yeah. Health Canada, you assume that it works rather than it's just well, It's safe. endorsed. Exactly. Well, I gotta be careful in my wording on that. Okay. I'm not sure if it's endorsed, but it has gone through their safety testing. So they can say that it is It's gone not endorsed, but it's safe. Right? Exactly. It's just like in Massachusetts, they recently passed a naturopath bill, which now they can register themselves and have their own registration. It seems like it's, that makes it approved by the government, when all really it's saying is they can set up their own board and certify themselves. Right. So they're not uh, endorsed by the government, but it gives it some legitimacy. Yeah. So maybe not endorsed, but an air of legitimacy. We'll yeah, call. absolutely. And again, as a consumer, You've got a cold, you're going to the drugstore, it's easy to make a mistake. And uh, especially if you go beyond that and you're, you're very sick, then you hope, beyond hope, that this is going to work. And you can see how when people are in that vulnerable state, it would be very easy to be taken advantage of, which is unfortunately happening a lot. I mean, another great example, or terrible example, is people claiming to talk to the dead, right? So you've got somebody who's going through this terrible loss, why would you lie to me? There must be something there everyone else is buying into this, right? So it, it, a lot of these ideas overlap in the sense that it's not, you know, if, if you have the basic skills to identify pseudoscience, you'll be able to 
identify when medicines might not work, when you're getting claims from charlatans saying that they can speak to the dead. Once you have the basic tools, you should be able to kind of identify a lot of these things. And I think some of the problems uh, right now is that as skeptics, we, we target individual uh, issues. So we'll, we'll target psychics and you know alternative medicine and so on. And what I'm trying to do, and that's good, but what I'm trying to do is take that step back and give the people people tools earlier so that just across the board they should be able to recognize that these are not valid claims. And easier said than done, but that's one of the goals that I have in, in training people at a younger age. I wonder if you're making an error in um, sorry, evaluating this in a little way because um, you're focusing on the, I'll, I'll say the consumer, the consumer of homeopathy, the consumer of a psychic medium. We'll call them consumers. Sure. Um, because they pay to go. Right. But I've met not too many psychics. Um, I've met some that say, yeah, I'm, that they will be up front and say, this is just a, the show I'm doing. But some of them actually believe it. They don't know how it's working. But gosh, they're saying things that people are relating to. So it's, it's, it's working. Right. So, and as far as homeopathy goes, there are the people that practice it if you tell them it's just water and it can't possibly work, they'll say, well, you don't understand how it works. Right. They can't, for some reason, they, that, that's their answer. You, well, you don't know how it works. It's not, it's not really that simple that we're just shaking things up. There's, you know, you don't understand what's going on. So you kind of have to get through to those people too, right? Do you understand you do. my question? Yeah. So you're, you're taking someone's belief system away from them. And I'm, I, I say belief system because I know for a fact that there are... Uh, theologians that have lost their belief but continue to practice because it's what they know. Right. So there, there's a lot there. So it's important there is, to I'm sorry. still. Oh no, it's important to still uh, help people that have these beliefs. And there's been some really neat research on this. Basically, what happens is let's um, let's use homeopathy as an example because we've been talking about it. But you believe homeopathy works. Somebody tells you it doesn't. Now you've got a cognitive gap. So you need to fill in that space with other information. And that can be difficult to do because if you phrase it wrong or you attack someone, you get something that's called a backfire effect. And they actually believe stronger. So they dig in their heels. Exactly. That's right. So you'll present what you think is this great evidence. But in fact, what you've done is somehow make their belief stronger in whatever it is that is not evidence-based. So there's a real risk there. And to tackle people where that's their profession, extremely difficult. I mean, if you think about the dissonance reduction there, so everything I've been doing is wrong. Uh, I shouldn't have this job, so I need training in something else. A lot of them have done a lot of training. The training is in things that aren't necessarily valid, but they worked hard at it. So how are you going to get through to that person and say what you're doing is harmful? And it, it's not easy. Um, I mean, that, that's where a lot of this research is looking at, and, and that's great. So what I'm saying is that in addition to that, if we could uh, get people when they're younger, that's a better chance than you have to, to convince them that perhaps they're, they need to look a bit deeper into some issues. And what, I mean, what the goal is, you hope people don't go down that path to become you know, the next John Edwards or you know, to become somebody who's promoting homeopathy and those types of things. So I think it's kind of a two-prong approach is you want to help people that have those beliefs and you also want to prevent those beliefs from, from really kind of manifesting themselves as people get older. Well, I suppose if you um, get the scientific thinking at a young age and you get enough people, then it'll dwindle anyway. Because you can profess that you're a psychic or a homeopath to the ends of the earth, but if 99% of the population doesn't believe you, you don't have a job. Exactly, exactly. Let me speak to you about the attacking and the digging in thing. I, I right. totally get that because, speaking anecdotally, <laughs> um, I was never attacked, um, but I kind of believed a lot of things just because I feel like I was pretty gullible. Um, I knew it at the time, and I know it even now more, and I'm not necessarily any better, but I do think about things. Um, but what got to me was someone else, hang up, someone having a third party. I was a third party to another conversation, right. which happened to be a YouTube video, someone on a book tour, they were talking, there was a large crowd, like at PsychOn here, and I just happened to be watching it, and I was convinced as a third party. Right. So that, as opposed to being the direct recipient, it was a little bit easier for me to go, because I argued with the guy in my head first, blah, 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 and I realized, wait a minute, this is all making sense here. So how do you underexpose people? Is that the word? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what I'm saying. So people aren't coming to PsychCon. People that come here are already, you're preaching to the choir. Exactly. All right. And how do you get it? 
get it beyond. Well, I think value in things like SciCon is we, we give everybody here obviously cares deeply about these issues, and they get more tools to kind of help and and you know spread this type of information and help people think properly about about claims. But as there's more resources out there, that's how you're going to convince people. I mean, if you look at the work James Randi has done, I always show his video on homeopathy, uh, and it's perfect. The one where he takes 200 sleeping pills? Uh, he just talks about it in this one. The oh, one okay. I show, he just talks about doing it because he said it tastes so bad. Yeah, it's chalk. And the nice thing is that you don't have to disagree with me, you disagree with the person on the screen, and he does such a good job just step by step walking the audience through that at the very least, I think you'd be motivated to look for a little bit more information. So just to kind of think that through. So I think the value in things like uh, PsyCon 2 is that some of those videos get on air, uh, they're on YouTube, um, programs like you're doing, and people see them and go, hmm, hadn't really thought of it that way. And it's a very non-threatening way to do it, but you need to get the information out there. If you look at the ghost hunting shows, they're interesting because of the, there's maybe a ghost. Going into a house and saying, there's no ghost here is boring. <laughs> <laughs> so we're at a disadvantage because when you're debunking things, and, and that might not be the right phrase, it's not as interesting as when you're trying to find the mystical stuff, right? Except for, if, if, let's say you're investigating something. Right. When you're investigating something and you don't find anything, it's really not that interesting. Yeah. Except yeah. it is in a way because nothing happened. And there's value in that. Right. Well, it depends on how it's done, but it has to be done masterfully. Otherwise, it can just come across as boring, or oh, yeah. th there's that burden of proof idea, right? Like, well, I didn't find anything, but that doesn't prove there's no such thing as ghosts. Well, it could is... mean the ghosts don't like to be videotaped. Exactly. Uh, a line that's used a lot, too, is negative energy. Well, there's yeah, a skeptic yeah. there, it's negative energy, so whatever's not working, you know, whatever quantum supposed effect is supposed to happen isn't happening because of the skeptic there. So these, these outs there... But um, That's a lot of control, by the way. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Let me I, get my quantum manipulator. Yeah, yeah. my favorite, um, have you heard of quantum man medicine? No. I don't know if this one's a spoof or not. I, I swear it's a spoof, but it, you can give them your credit card, so I don't know. Oh, it's but probably not then. Probably not, but you could download medicine, and uh, you pay them for it, and then if you got a cold, instead of taking a pill, you watch what was on the screen. So it's downloadable quantum medicine. Wow. That is the most ridiculous one I've come across Sounds yet. like something's going to be shut down by the FTC or something. <laughs> yeah. And uh, they have a section on the website, and this is why I think it might be a spoof, is uh, the section is actually titled Skepticism. And so you click on it, and there's just a list of quotes why skepticism's bad. It's just hilarious if it's meant to be, and if not, it's, it's quite sad. Well, skepticism does get a bad rap because I think it's defined as just, well, I, I guess it's another one of those things that people define too many ways when I just think of it's kind of like a little bit more thoughtful. Right. Right. You want to look at the evidence before you make a move, or, or at least try to. Yeah. And then realize that you're still biased and you made your move basically on emotion anyway. <laughs> so exactly. You tried your best, but what are you going to do? Well, that's why I, uh, I like to frame in terms of scientific skepticism. So just give a little bit more context to what we're doing. So we get a claim, we don't dismiss it out of hand, but let's just see what evidence is really there, how we got that evidence. And, and go from that, that point rather than just kind of rejecting out of hand. And that's not what skeptics do, but I think that's the perception of what skeptics do, is that they're just skeptical of everything and just won't, they're not open-minded, right? That's, that's what you hear a lot. Right. Rather than, than what I tell my students is when you approach a claim that seems fairly extraordinary, it's like, that's cool. Let's see if there's any evidence. That's interesting. And then usually as you start walking down the path, you see, well, there's no evidence for this particular claim. And you're, let me just play devil's advocate again. Something I've heard before is that, you know, you spoke about evidence and whatnot. Why do I need to think at all? Because I can perceive, I can intuit, right. I can infer. You know, I know what's going on. The problem is our brains do a great job most of the time. But we have these biases that we all fall prey to. They're, they're built in. And if you're not aware of them, you're going to make mistakes occasionally. Now, for the most part, we take in a ton of information process it quickly and effectively. It's amazing. But uh, one of the examples I really like to use is just a really simple study. People were asked how assertive they were. Now, if I were to ask you how assertive you are, you, you know how assertive you are, right? Nobody knows better than ourselves how assertive we are. But what the researchers did is they just did this manipulation. They said, for half the people, before you answer, list six times you were assertive. For the other half, list 12 times. What they found is for the people that listed 12 times they were assertive, they rated themselves as far less assertive than people who listed six. The reason why is if you list six times you're assertive, that's easy to do. And they'll go, oh, 
I see. Yeah, okay, I quickly came up with six. I must be very assertive. They rate themselves higher. 12 times is hard to do. Most people peter out around eight or nine, and they'll go, I couldn't even get to 12. I guess I'm not that assertive. So it ties into this idea of availability, what's most on our mind. You're like, I just wrote down six times as assertive. It came to me like that. I guess I'm very assertive. I mean, that study is amazing. You've changed how somebody views themselves by simply asking the question different. There's all sorts of research showing things like that. So uh, a lot of what Elizabeth Loftus has done with misinformation, just by changing the question, we can change what we remember. Priming is really interesting. So there's all these things happening you showing. Mean, may I? You mean yeah. simple things like she will change a word, like how fast was the car going when it hit? How fast was the car going when it crashed? That's right. A descriptive word. And there are other studies that will do things like uh, just studying, uh, not anonymously, but surreptitiously how generous people are and if they give people, I'm making one up, but you make people take a math test first and then they're in a bad mood so they're less generous right. when they walk out of the room. I mean, that's a terrible example, but it's similar things like that. So that's manipulating, that's, that's trying to understand how people manipulate themselves. I well, mean, manipulate might be too strong a word, but... When we convince ourselves of a lot of things. If you look at dissonance reduction, that's the classic example. And we've all experienced dissonance, but we don't know a dissonance it. reduction. Yeah, okay. If you buy anything expensive, so let's say you buy a new car, what happens, and there's lots of research showing, as soon as you drive off that lot, you've inflated the value of the car right. you bought, deflated everything else. Right. And that's not necessarily a bad thing because it makes you feel better, right? If you're leaving the, the, the dealership and you're miserable with your choice, you're gonna feel awful. You wanna feel like you made a smart decision. Exactly, but that dissonance reduction, since we don't really understand what's happening, it makes us feel maybe a little bit more confident in what we're doing. And it ties into confirmation bias too, in the sense that when there's information that um, agrees with what we already previously um, hold to be true, we like that a lot. And there's actually some cool studies done with fMRIs, and you can see there's areas of the brain that become active that are associated with pleasure. So when people agree with us, it feels good. When people don't agree with us, it feels bad. So we either have to reject that person or change our beliefs. We don't like changing our beliefs very much, especially if they're value-laden. It's really difficult. So things like religion or you know, hot topic issues like abortion, gun control, things like that. Much easier to reject someone else than change your value system. So not being aware of that too, I mean, we all fall prey to confirmation bias. It just happens. But when you're aware of it, you can step back. If you're having an argument with someone, you go, you know, <laughs> I might be wrong. They might be wrong, but I'm just going to, I need to step back a little bit and think about it rather than just digging in because that's what happens. If you think about any value-laden argument you've had with somebody, you've probably never won. No one does, ever. And I survey my students every year. It's like, okay, so pick an issue. And so something maybe like, gun control. Well, value laden is very difficult. Exactly. Well, you, you simply won't do it because people just dig in. <laughs> that's it. And uh, so it's interesting to find, try to find strategies to kind of help overcome that. And I think one way to do it is to help people understand some of these biases that we have that, that can lead us astray. Um, I had, it's interesting because I had a question really about that. You probably covered quite a bit of it, but is there one-stop shopping for correcting your own biases? I mean, can, is there a checklist I can do? I mean, you've just named some cognitive biases, but right. um, how can I get quicker at it? So how can I make the availability heuristic available for cognitive thinking? Right. In other words, how can I correct myself fast? Um, well, you, we have you a lot of different biases. And I think one way to think about it is that just to, you need to be able to catch yourself. So there's one called the fundamental attribution error. And Fundamental all, attribution error. Right. And all that means is that when we see someone doing something, we make a dispositional attribution, which means we think it's about them. Uh, if, if we're at a restaurant and there's a, a server who's being rude, we think that person's a jerk. We don't take into account the environment. We don't think they might be busy. Maybe they've had a bad day. Just that person, <laughs> they're not being nice. That's a bad person. It's a bit simplistic, but that's essentially what happens. So when we see actors out there, so somebody you know, that we're observing, whatever they're doing, we see as a trait that's reflecting them. With us, we don't do that with ourselves. So if we see someone slip and fall, we go, that person's clumsy. If we slip and fall, we say, the sidewalk's broken. It's completely different. Or if I am rude, I'm a good person, but I'm in a bad mood. Exactly, exactly. I've had a bad day. It's not me, I'm just having a bad day. Right. It's we so, excuse ourselves. That's right, exactly. And it's so powerful that it always happens, but you can kind of stop it. And the way you stop it, it's a two-step process. It'll happen, and then you catch it. And I think that's really kind of the approach you need to take with these biases. If you know what they are, they're still going to happen. We're, we're kind of hardwired that way. It'll happen, but then you go, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> maybe there's something else going on. So that person that just cut me off, rather than you know yelling and screaming at them, maybe they're in a rush because there's an emergency. Right. That's what I try to do now. Right. 
But it, the first thing that happens is that you get the tension, right? And then, okay. <laughs> so it's that two-step process to overcome a lot of these biases. Um, it's interesting because, you know, I talk to a lot of, I'm not the brightest bulb in the box or in the room because I don't even know how, what the phrase is. <laughs> so, and I use that sometimes when I start these conversations, but part of the reason I feel that way is because I talk to so many smart people, I just start, I'm, I'm learning that I, there's so much I don't know. I don't even know if I can trust myself. So it's, right. it's difficult. What do you find with your students after they start to understand that they're, they're biases and they might be lacking critical thinking? There's got to be a like for my, I don't have to say there, there has to be, but for myself, there comes that time where you start questioning yourself even more than ever. So right. now what? So you've ruined my life. Now what do I do? <laughs> I've had a few, not, not saying I've ruined their life, but saying that like, now I don't know anything because I'm exactly. second guessing myself. But, but now they're really learning. That's right. Okay. And I didn't mean to take that it, line away from you. Oh, no, no, that's coming. fine. But, that, but I mean, that, that is it. So they're, they're starting to understand. And people are always really appreciative of it once they've gone through, especially with the, the upper level course focused on pseudoscience, because then they, they just start to spot it and they know quite quickly, not all the time, but quite quickly. And they annoy their friends. I, I give a, a talk How to on lose that too. Friends. <laughs> exactly. I, I do tell them, you gotta tone it down when you're talking to people, because remember, and I think the most important thing I tell them when you're talking with somebody, intelligent people are more likely to believe or more likely to be able to defend themselves and they're worse at hearing the counter argument. And right now you can think of Probably five people like that. Don't go home and start calling them. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Because they're not are smart your mission. People. They just haven't been trained like you have. So you need to think back. When did you believe this stuff? Because everybody's believed in some form of it. And uh, what changed your mind? Uh, Phil Plate did a great talk at TAM a number of years ago. It's, it's on YouTube. It's fantastic. And I show parts of that to the class as well. And his point is you've never changed a mind by screaming at someone. So take that step back. And it can be frustrating. But take that step back and think about, imagine you're in their shoes. What, what would help? How would a conversation help? Uh, and I mean, really with science communication, that, that's not a bad way to think about it. Um, Alan Alda is actually doing some really yeah. interesting stuff on science communication. I like his idea of empathy. Let's put ourselves inside the heads of others. And if you understand the biases too, it's like, oh, you know, I understand a little bit about why this person might think that. So if we understand what availability is, if we understand what dissonance is. And I think what happens is you start to become not sympathetic, but it's not that you need to win anymore. You can have that conversation. And I even say to people sometimes, like, I understand why you believe that. And I can, it makes perfect sense to me. And then I'll explain some of these concepts. It's just something to think about. And then people can take that step back and reflect on it. Because if you just try to hammer somebody and try to get them to change their mind, especially valuating, it, it just simply won't happen. Let's sum this up with a different, so we've gone over a lot of cognitive biases, how to um, try and correct yourself. But now, what makes a good argument? Yeah, well, you can start to get into logic and things of that nature well, too. What's a good argument for a lay person? Right, right. <laughs> I'm not going to pick it apart and premise it and what are the hidden premises and all this. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so, well, or if you want, if it has to go that way, it has to go that way. So I don't think it does though, because again, for the lay person, people are busy. They just don't have time to, you know, get into the, the philosophy of arguments and so on. I think the best strategy really is to just give people those warning signs of pseudoscience. Okay. And at least if you have that, hopefully something will be triggered when you see a claim that may not be accurate. That's the strategy that I'm trying to employ with my students. And uh, beyond that, it, you, you kind of need to take that extra step a bit. And, and you can go into, you know, what makes a good argument versus a bad argument and, you know, some of the logic behind that. But I think that gets a little bit complex for the layperson. And, and when, it, when we talk about layperson, just somebody who's not interested in this area, yeah, yeah. it's not. It's not a know. derogatory no, term. I'm not, a layperson. Yeah. You're well, an expert on your thing, I'm exactly. an expert on mine. So we're a lay person in everything except social psychology. So it, it just means somebody who's not in that field. Let me make it more of a consumer question then, because that's part of your research interest as well. What, right. When I say, see that 9 out of 10 dentists recommend yakety yak toothpaste, right. is that a good argument on the side of yakety yak toothpaste? Right. And if you have those uh, understandings of signs of pseudoscience, say, okay, well, that number doesn't mean anything. That's anecdotal evidence, 9 out of 10, but what, what did they do? that probably does, is nonsensical. And then you could say, well, I really care about toothpaste. <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna hunt down how they did this. Okay. Most people won't do that, but if you really care, then, then you might. And hopefully uh, people have the tools to do that now. Uh, 
at the very least, you could go on, say, the, uh, the toothpaste website, and th maybe there would be some information there on how they got that information. If they don't have that information, you might be a little bit uh, suspicious as well. Um, okay. One last point I want to talk to you about. I'm sorry, I think I already said that, so here's... Uh, oh, yeah. no, that's fine. So, um, let's go back to homeopathy just for one second. I have someone else coming on I want to talk, I'm going to talk about with that. Um, but one of the interesting things about homeopathy, you said that it's sold in drugstores right next to real medicine. Right. I actually did a little bit of research and they have a link on the store's website, what is homeopathy, and when you click on it, it explains and it says right in the description, this is not, you know, this is scientifically implausible. But I mean, if you read what they say about it themselves. That's right. So you don't have to go very far, and then you come off of saying, well, why are they selling this then? What, what, I don't understand this disclaimer. So they've argued against themselves in a way. Yeah, those warning labels, well, not warning, I guess, but those labels are on, uh, I don't know what yeah, they call them, informative the, labels or something. They're there in the uh, drugstores in Canada as well, but a lot of people won't read them. I mean, do you ever really read the uh, potential side effects? In a no, bottle, Tylenol or because like I that? will have every one of them. <laughs> right. So even if you do read it, what some practitioners of alternative, some alternative medicine will do is they'll spin it in a way that it confirms what they're saying. And they'll say, well, Western medicine or how are they going to frame it? So they use it as support that well, just because it can't be tested using the scientific method. And it's really interesting because they'll say, well, you know, the science shows that this works and not everything can be explained by science. And they'll do it in such a way, it's almost like one sentence behind the other. And the ones who are good, it's convincing. You, you don't recognize that there's this inherent, uh, you know, uh, disparity between the logic here and it'll sell people on it. Because when you buy into that, it's, it's really a belief system, right? And part of that belief system is that traditional medicine is bad, or medicine as we see medicine, or at least aspects of it are bad. And then when you have that in mind, you can say that label, look what they made us do. And if you believe already, frame it in terms of dissonance, it's like, ah, that makes sense. That fits the narrative that they've created, and it could actually probably negate any effect that those labels are having for the true believers. Gosh, there's a lot to think about here. <laughs> there is, there is. Um, is there any website you'd like to tell people they can go to for quick and dirty information? Or, I mean, there's Quack Watch, there's a bunch yep. of... Yeah, Quack Watch is good. Uh, CSI is really good. Um, what I like... CSI is Committee for Skeptical That's Inquirer. That's right, yeah. Uh, I like that website because they have a lot of very accessible articles and they're really engaging writing. So that, that's one I, I send my students to a lot of the articles there. Um, yeah, I mean, those are some of the big ones. There's, there's a lot of good stuff out there. I'm kind of blanking. There's, there's a lot. That's okay. But, well, yeah. if you get to Skeptical Inquirer, you'll get start getting exactly. uh, other places, which yeah. is what happened to me, actually. You just, oh, yeah? It just starts. It wasn't Skeptical Inquirer, but that's how I found it. You just start. There's an avalanche of material out there once you start the snowball rolling. So. Yeah, exactly. All right. Dr. Rodney Schmaltz, uh, Associate Professor at McEwen University. Sorry, I almost said it backward there. <laughs> Thank you very much for being on 502 Conversations. And do you like to be called a, your Associate Professor, but are you Social Psychology, Cognitive Psychology? You're uh, social, social Psychology. Social psych Psychology. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much for being here. All right. Thank you. 502 Conversations. You can reach me at 502conversations at gmail.com. If you really did not like this conversation, you can search out his email address and send that to him. <laughs> Keep my bias about what a great person I am alive, <laughs> <Okay>. please. <laughs> thank you very much. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. It's a pleasure. Thank you.